So we're reading from Psalm 30, which I'd encourage you to find on page 558 of your church Bible. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths, and you did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord, my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from the grave, you spared me from going down to the pit. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his, praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only for a moment, but his favour lasts for a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I shall never be shaken. O Lord, when you favoured me, you made my mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What gain is there in my destruction, in my going down into the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my help. You turned my waiting into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. And my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. This is the word of the Lord. Tristan's going to come and expand God's word to us, so let's just pray for Tristan as he comes. Lord, thank you for Tristan and the words that you've spoken to him as he's been preparing uh, what he's going to say to us this week. We pray for ourselves as we listen that you would give us insight and discernment into what is for us and what you want us to hear in our lives. Amen. Good morning. Please forgive me if I sound a little rough. The cold that's going around has caught up with me and I'm rather fuzzy headed. It's not COVID. I tested this morning. It's definitely not COVID. But uh, it's left me a little bit, um, a little bit bleary. So bear with me. <clears throat> this is uh, the last session then in our mini series on praying the Psalms. Uh, next week, if you can believe it, is the start of Advent. <coughs> This all comes around a bit quickly, doesn't it? But um, So we didn't cover the first session of the, the Psalms thing in this 10.30 service, but the three themes we've had so far have been uh, praise at all times from Psalm 34, rest in weary times from Psalm 62, and strength in troubled times from Psalm 46. And this week we're looking at if you hadn't picked it up so far, joy in thankful times. And as we heard Nick read, that's looking at the topic from the perspective of Psalm 30. To be honest, I feel like there's a, a certain sense of, of irony in talking about joy, uh, because if you ask my family which of these two characters uh, was most like me, I'm pretty certain I know which one they'd pick. And he's not yellow. But as anyone who stands up here and speaks will tell you, it's usually the case that the person who most needs to hear what God is saying is the one who's doing the actual speaking uh, in the first place. So for the next 15 minutes, I invite you to listen in as I talk to Mr. Grumpy about joy. <coughs> Hopefully by now you've realized that um, I always try and squeeze in a little film reference into a sermon, and, and this time around it was particularly easy uh, because this was the first thing I thought of when I, I heard of the, the title of the, uh, of the talk. Uh, this has got to be one of my favourite films of the last uh, few years, um, and no matter how many times I've watched it, and I've watched it countless times, uh, I always cry in the same two places. Now, if you've seen it, you might know which two places they are. I don't know if it's Peak Doctor's writing or Michael Giacchino's score, or, or a combination of the both, but it, it just does what all Pixar films seem to do, and it hits you right in the feels. 
I think that's, that's particularly apt for this film. So this film has uh, got main characters who are the emotions in an 11-year-old girl's head. For those that don't know, we've got here, we've got anger. Uh, that's the one my children think is me as well. Uh, joy, sadness, disgust, and fear. And they operate this control panel that uh, operates Riley's, uh, operates Riley, who is the 11-year-old girl. So Joy is kind of nominally in charge, and she spends all of her time trying to make sure that Riley is happy and that sadness doesn't take over and start operating the control panel. And I don't want to give away any spoilers if you haven't seen the film, uh, but by the end of the film, Joy kind of realises that actually life is a little bit more complicated than just trying to be happy all the time, um, and that our life-defining moments tend to be made up of a, a mixture of emotions. And it is possible for, for sadness and for joy to coexist without life going catastrophically wrong. If you haven't yet seen Inside Out, please go and watch it immediately. <laughs> or at least after the service. But we're not here to talk about films. Well, we are, because I always talk about films. But we're not here to talk just about films. We're looking at Psalm 30. And if you look in, in uh, your Bibles, the Church Bibles, uh, which is the NIV version, um, this psalm is headed a, a psalm, a song, for the dedication of the Temple of David, which I find quite an interesting heading, because firstly, the psalm doesn't really talk about the Temple, or it doesn't appear to, um, and secondly, David wasn't actually even alive when the Temple was dedicated. Go figure. Maybe he wrote it beforehand. I don't know. The King James Version has a slightly different heading. It says, a psalm and song at the dedication of the house of David. Um, so whether it's the dedication of the temple or the dedication of David's house, I don't think it really matters. The point is that David was, was dedicating something to God, whether it's his house or his temple. Um, it was a dedication, and that's, that's the theme of this psalm. And we're going to come back to that a little bit later on, so, so bear that in mind as we go through. So, just like Joy's journey throughout Inside Out, this psalm is a little bit of a roller coaster. This is my terrible picture of a roller coaster. It's probably, yeah, that's a pretty scary roller coaster. I don't know quite what would happen when you hit that bottom, it'd probably crash, but imagine it's a roller coaster. So, the psalm starts off reflecting on David's life um, before the psalm, and as Claire pointed out, that bit at the, the beginning, that's all in the past tense. Um, but, but that was a low point in David's life. Uh, he was always under threat from Saul, uh, but in verses three, 1 to 3, David thanks God for three things. He thanks him for deliverance from his enemies, he thanks him for answering his prayers, and he thanks him for rescuing him from impending death. And then we're on this kind of upward slope. So we carry on and upward, uh, and in verses 4 to 5, he calls on God's faithful people to join with him in praising God for all that he's done. Perhaps that's the little bit that references the temple. Who knows? But it's, it's basically calling on people to worship God. Then it all starts to go a little bit wrong. In verse 6, David starts to boast. In the ESV, it reads this. It says, As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. David kind of forgets that his position of security, his position of prosperity... It's actually all down to God rather than of his own making. And, and that causes God to hide his face from David in verse 7. So we're on this downward slope now. Back down the slope and, and David is, is seemingly close to death and he cries out to God for help uh, and in verses 8 to 10. That's kind of the bottom of that slope. And God responds by turning wailing into dancing and replacing sackcloth with joy. He says, so that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. David ends the psalm, thankfully on an upward. He ends the psalm with this realisation that he needs to keep on praising God forever. forever. He needs to give thanks at all times. What I find interesting is, is the point at which David says he's being clothed with joy. It comes right near the end of the psalm, and it's after he cries out to God. 
after he's kind of changed his attitude from, hey, look how great I am, to acknowledging that everything he has is a gift from God. In verse 5, he says that weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Throughout the Psalms, this idea of night followed by morning is it's almost a kind of a metaphor for um, the time when God intervenes or when those who are in difficulty kind of in, in the darkness, in the night, they see God coming and working within that, that dawn of, of that realisation. So here in, in this psalm, joy isn't a consequence of circumstance. It's a consequence of acknowledging God. Acknowledging all he has done for us. All he has given to us. Regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in. There's a, a verse about joy that's often quoted, and actually we had it right at the beginning of our service. The joy of the Lord is your strength. That's actually only part of a verse, and it comes from Nehemiah 8, and it's verses 9 and 10, which read this. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites, who were instructing the people, said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So this is in Nehemiah, obviously, and, and what's happened is the Israelites have returned from exile, uh, and Ezra, who's the, the priest, has been reading out the book of the law out loud to the whole congregation as they listened. And their response initially was, was sorrow, as they kind of suddenly felt uh, the full weight of their sin and, and the whole burden of why they've been in exile in the first place. But Nehemiah encourages them to celebrate and, and to be joyful in all that God has done for them in bringing them back to Israel. In this passage, it's actually uh, God who's joyful first. It's the joy of the Lord, not joy in the Lord. God is the one who's rejoicing. He's rejoicing that over those who've come back to him this nation who he exiled have actually come back to him and, and God's rejoicing about that. And that response that he gives, rather than bringing condemnation on them uh, and, and making them feel bad, actually gives them then the strength to accept his gift of love and grace towards them. Their circumstances haven't changed and their perspective of God has. As they acknowledge him, he gives them strength to turn their sorrow into joy through thankfulness. The way that, that God's rejoicing there in, on the return of, of Israel reminds me of, of those stories that Jesus tells in Luke 15. You've got the story of the lost sheep uh, and the lost coin and the lost or the prodigal son. So each of those stories ends kind of in the same way. You've got the lost thing is found and, and it ends with joy and thankfulness. And elsewhere in the New Testament, we, we look at joy and we see a story of, of joy irrespective of circumstance. I'm going to jump about a little bit in scripture here, so um, maybe don't try and follow me. But if you would like to know what they are, I'll tell you later. So James 1, 2 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. 2 Corinthians 7.4 I have spoken to you with great frankness. I take great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged. In all our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. 1 Thessalonians 1.6 You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the, mes the message in the midst of severe suffering, with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 6, 4-10 Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience and kindness, in the Holy Spirit and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonour, 
bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. Joy here then is, is a gift of the Holy Spirit and has nothing to do with circumstance and everything to do with acknowledging God and all he does for us. I've recently been reading this book, uh, which is The Widening Circle by Graham Tomlin. And it's all about uh, Christ's role as high priest and, and how that kind of plays out in, in humanity and in the church. And, and there's a chapter about how as humans, humanity has this, this priestly responsibility towards uh, creation to nurture it and to protect it. And it says this on page 85. And I'm not going to read it in there because it's too small and I haven't got my glasses. It says, the key to sanctifying, the sanctifying of creation is thanksgiving. When we say grace before a meal, for example, it is as if that act turns an ordinary piece of food into a sacred gift from God. It is said to be consecrated by the word of God and prayer. Literally, the word is hagiazotai, if my Greek pronunciation is correct. Made holy. It is reconnected with God, as it were. Thanksgiving turns an object into a gift. Something ordinary into something holy. That brings us back round to this, this kind of topic of dedication that we saw at the beginning. Right at the beginning of that psalm, it says that the psalm is headed either as this dedication for the temple or for David's house. And when we dedicate something, we, we give thanks for it. Grace before a meal is, is in a way a, a dedication of that meal that we're about to eat. It's acknowledging that it comes from God. I love the idea of, of turning something ordinary into something holy simply by thanking God for it. And that seems to be the lesson that David learns by the end of this psalm. He says, Lord my God, I will praise you forever. The ESV reads, Oh Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. So rather than dedicating the temple or David's house, what if our response to this psalm is to de dedicate our lives, our bodies as the temple of the Holy Spirit, as Corinthians puts it. And that in that dedication, we make a commitment to thankfulness in all circumstances. We can't avoid the roller coaster of life, but we can experience joy throughout it. At the heights, we give glory to God for all that he's done. And in the lows, we thank him anyway and trust that he's in control. Just like joy learns in Inside Out, our life can't be highs all the time. And in fact, it's that mixture of highs and lows that make up our, kind of, our core memories, as the film puts it, our key experiences. Psalm 30 then urges us to dedicate our lives fully to God, to be thankful to God wherever we are on the roller coaster, whether we're on the mountaintop or at the bottom of a valley. That's the key to experiencing joy in all circumstances. Give thanks to God in all circumstances and find joy in our thankfulness. So the question really is, is how do we respond to that? Um, and that's down to you. That's down to what you want to take from that, how you feel God is, has spoken to you. Um, There's a couple of thoughts we had as we were praying earlier. One is that you might want to spend some time in, in almost dedicating your life to God. And maybe you've never done that before. Maybe you've never given your life to God and you want to take the opportunity this morning to dedicate your life to him. Uh, and at the end of the service, there'll be people here to pray with you if you want to do that. Perhaps you want to recommit, rededicate. But we're going to move on to communion in a moment. And, and actually, that's a really good time to practice thankfulness. It's, it's a reminder of all that Jesus has done for us. And we can spend time thanking him for that. We can thank him for his 
presence with us as we take communion. And so we're going to move on into a, a short time of worship. It's a quieter kind of reflective time. So as we do that, um, let's spend time thanking God. And then Helen will bring communion to us. <laughs>